Welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So this video here is part three on the Mark I GT Ford Cortina that we're doing a full respray on. We're gonna be picking up straight where we left off in part two. So last video, we finished off all our repairs and then mastered up for primer and now we're getting our two pack primer on. So the primer I'm using is the Concept High Solids Primer. And as you guys probably already know, I'm pretty impressed with the way this stuff performs. Concept is a bit of a budget paint line, but some of their materials are extremely good. I rank this just as high as the Standox and Glazeret primers, which you will pay three times plus four, depending on where you get them from. It gives a nice build, it sands down really well, and shrink back is never usually an issue, as long as you make sure it gets a bit of a bake out. This is something that I've been a little bit more aware of lately, compared to where I used to work in the smash shop, when you would paint a car, two days later it would be gone. Now I've got my own shop, sometimes you'll have the cars sitting around for you know three or four weeks depending if you're waiting on parts and especially these bigger jobs, um, it can take some time to get them done. So you leave them uh, two or three weeks and then you'll be getting all this shrink back coming through. It looks fine a couple of days after painting it, but then once all that primer is actually uh, properly dried and then all the clear coats dried, you will start getting shrink back. So I do all I can these days to uh, have that shrink back happen before I even start laying that color down. So infrared lights is what you'll actually see me putting on this later on. If you've got a baking oven, even that's you know good, say an hour, especially on a job like this, bake it out for an hour and then leave it for a day or two. However, I have found that infrared is the best way to do it. And look, even the bank of lights that I've got, I'll show you guys later on, um, they're not massive, but you can do a panel at a time and it probably only took me a little bit over an hour to do the entire car. You probably only need 10 minutes per panel because they get so hot. I've got my infrared thermometer as well, so that'll actually tell me how hot I'm getting it. You don't want to go anything above 100 degrees, trust me, I've done it before. Um, so the gun I'm using here is the Air Gunza AZ-3. I've actually since sold this gun. It's got a 1.8mm fluid tip on it, and I really do like this gun. Reason I sold it is because I just had to make room for some more in my arsenal. I've got the Devilbus GPI, and uh, it come with a 1.6, 1.8, and also a 1.4mm fluid tip on it. So I decided, you know what, that can be my primer gun. So I'll just swap it over to the 1.8, and that will be what I'll be using for primer from now on. I did actually just do a review and demonstration on that gun recently, so go and check that out on my channel if you haven't already seen it. And I included all the different needles in the review, so you'll be able to see exactly how each one sprays in different circumstances with the same gun. I'll actually also be applying the base coat and clear coat on this car with that gun, because at this point I actually hadn't had it turn up yet. But halfway through this job, as I was getting it prepped up, the uh, tools turned up. So uh, in the next coming videos, you'll see again how that GPI does perform. But I have been quite impressed with it so far. So this thing was actually an ex-race car. And let me tell you now, it's probably had more hits than Elvis. You can tell it's been in a few front-end collisions and just loads of dings and dents and stuff all over the entire thing. So before it goes back on the road, it's really going to need a nice block down and loads of primer. Now you'll probably see later on in this video, I say that I'm actually putting five and a half liters of primer on. It may sound like quite a lot of primer and it is, but you need that material on to block it down. Some of the ripples, you just won't be able to get out without putting some nice two pack primer that does sand well. Um, it's really hard to sand some of the paint. It seems to clog up. A little bit more than your primer does and also once you start sanding through then you'll start sanding unevenly so you really do need to just do your best on the filler repairs first and then just load the primer up on it and then block that down and as it turned out there was spots all over this car that I had to re-repair just with little filler repairs and stuff like that but to be honest I believe that this kind of work is where I shine. I've had a bit of experience with it. The owner is not looking for absolute, it's not a restoration, which is why I've been calling it a project. 
respray, not a restoration. I believe a restoration is where you would maybe even take all the paint off and you're restoring it to original condition. I don't even think that this is actually the original color on the car. There were spots on the parcel shelf and also when I cut right down to the uh, bare metal, you could see it turned gray. But look, the owner is looking for a quick tidy up. He's realistic about what he's going to get in his budget. He knows that he could spend anywhere from thirty to hundred thousand dollars to get a full restoration. I personally don't believe it's worth spending that much on a car and I kind of don't really get it. I mean I can really appreciate a good looking car compared to a awesome looking car but um, the difference in between that is lots of money and kind of really wank factor at the end of the day. Uh, the kind of people that sit around and polish each other's ball joints at the car shows. I'm happy just with a car that looks nice when it's driving down the street and the extra $100,000 or whatever you may spend on your show car compared to my decent race spray will not be noticed as you're driving down the street. But that's just my take on it. There's no right or wrong when it comes to stuff like that. And hey, if you love doing your show car work, well then good on you. But it's just not my thing. It never really has been. I do enjoy going to car shows and appreciating the hours and hours that people have spent on their car and the way they love their cars, but it's just not me. So that's my first coat down. I decided to leave the reducer out for that first coat to help with a bit of build. Obviously the more reducer you put in, it's gonna come out the gun a bit nicer, but you lose a little bit of film build on it. So um, I was hoping also that leaving the reducer out would make it uh, not quite as aggressive and not so likely to bite into the um, old paint and less chance of shrink back. But I'm gonna leave this for probably five, another five minutes. Let that first coat dry right out and really observe my flash off times to hope uh, reduce any chance of shrink back on it. Some people might say, oh, but um, when you're doing primer work, you're meant to do the entire panel first and then put your extra coats on the cut throughs last. But on a job this size, you can end up getting lost and you'd be like, well, I think there was a repair here. Like if it was just say this, um, this one panel that I was doing, I'll say this one, this is a better uh, example. So it was just this one panel and I had these cut throughs here, a little bit of a repair here and a repair up there then you could remember exactly where those spots are that you need your extra primer. So you'd put the first coat over the whole thing, maybe your second coat over the whole thing, and then your final two just over these areas. What that does is stop any of this overspray contamination, um, which sometimes if you're uh, going over with your next coat, it can go a bit furry, but I have found the best way to um, work around that is just don't try to fill it up. Um, just put a normal coat on. If it looks a bit dusty, so bad. It's only primer, you'll be able to sand it out. Um, but if you go and try and really pump it on and fill it up, well then that'll turn into, you'll end up getting pinholes, which you won't be able to sand out, so. Hope that makes sense, not trying to um, confuse anyone. So that's it, all primed up. I ended up uh, using five and a half litres of primer on it. Pretty happy with how it's came up. Now at least we've got two pack over the whole thing now and something that we can actually sand into. So over the areas where the repairs were, they ended up getting two thick coats and then the entire car got two thinner coats with 10% reducer. So I'm happy that I've got enough on there, need be. Um, I'll probably put a little bit of fine filler in here and there, like you got a few little um, pinholes and stuff like that. But I'll be going around and nipping them up before, like, see so there's pinholes there. I'll do that even before I start uh, blocking it with 180 grit. I've found um, less chance of rubbing through doing that and uh, more chance of getting it straighter because if you, um, if you block it all down and you 320 it and 500 it and then you put your fine filler in and then you're probably sanding it out with something like 500 grit and you'll end up with a bit of a, a ripple there where you put your filler. That's the way I was taught to do it back in the day but I've actually since found uh, there's better ways around it and that's to put it in first. You can see a little bit of shrink back through here. 
this was <coughs> a couple of those panels that was done in acrylic so I'm not really surprised I've got a feeling the owners um, he's a real world dude he's not expecting miracles out of it so ready to get some color on the insides of these panels I've got the body out there baking because as you can see out here it's a pretty miserable overcast day so um, I've got the infrared lights out there on the body and ready to start getting some color on the inside of these. So I've sanded these all down just with 320 grit on the inside here. Seam sealed it all up here. Next step, I'm just gonna give it a tack rag over while blowing the air over it. And I've decided because this one here has got so many still uh, cut throughs left, um, I had a little bit of primer left over from a job I just primed up. I'll put a touch more reducer in that and just put a, um, a thin coat just to seal it all down. That'll only take a couple of minutes to dry in this weather. It's still pretty warm today, probably about 25 degrees. Um, by the time I've mixed the base coat up, it should be right to just about go straight away. And I've got my base coat color here mixed up. If you're interested, you want to know what color it is we just got a color card from the concept paints range and that ended up being the color code so it's the fair color 854 or 160 and that's the color card that I did to give us an idea of if it's going to be accurate and it, it's good enough especially for a full respray and I'm going to be using the concept HS clear So ready to get that paint on now, as I said before, I gave it a good tack rag and wiped it down with prep soles. Sometimes I do skip that stage on the inside of bonnets and boot lids, but I just decided I wanted to do it this time. This really takes me back to being an apprentice when this is about all I was allowed to do with a spray gun by spraying the insides of panels. But I tell you what, you do learn a lot even doing this kind of stuff. You learn how to mix your color up. You learn the basics of how paint's going to react. Little things like even being able to clear over some sanding scratches on solid colors and darker colors. And just getting the general feel of a spray gun and what it's like to paint thinning ratios, clears, how to mix your primers and clears up and all that stuff. It's all uh, relative to uh, being a good painter and learning how to do the job correctly. Um, these days, most of the time uh, in a smash shop, I would just put this on a bonnet flipper or something or a stand that you'd be able to do the inside and out at the same time. But um, for this instance, I decided I just wanted to be able to focus on the exterior of the panel uh, at the once without worrying about the inside at the same time and um, an extra sort of maybe half an hour or so that I might lose in my own shop it's not such a big deal when you're working in those high volume smash shops that every minute counts and you've really got to get as much work as you can done in a day. I actually do really miss doing smash work. I absolutely love just setting myself a goal and I don't even know if the other guys that I was always working with knew it, but I was always racing them just in my head, seeing if they could get three cars done, if I could get four or five cars done. Um, I loved it. My bosses obviously loved it. And I think it just came from back being an apprentice, wanting to leave the workshop as much as anything. I guess it's as much that as having a good work ethic as well. And always the way I used to look at it is the more money my boss makes, the more money he can afford to give me. And I would like to be getting paid the best I possibly can. I made over $100,000 uh, the year before I left to start up my own workshop, which made it a little bit difficult here at times looking back and I was on say taking home $2,000 a week plus sometimes I think the best I did was $3,000 in the hand um, but that was including some work up at the airport after hours but um, yeah then coming to this place sometimes you go months and months with out making much money at all but not to worry I did definitely have a bit of fun at this shop I'm speaking in past tense because I'm actually now in Thailand broadcasting from the land of smiles living it up editing videos and I'm having a month off before I go and start working in Bangkok it's gonna be slow to start off I'm gonna be doing some marketing and sales and then 
Fingers crossed we'll be getting our spray center up and running ASAP. But we do have some connections there and I know a couple of people that have some spray boosts there who reckon that they'll be happy to let us do some paint work in exchange for just using their materials. So PPG Thailand just said, yep, we've got a booth. You're welcome to use it, but just use some of our materials. So I'm looking forward to using the Enviro base, which I think is probably the product they'll be trying to push. I've heard it's really good, but yeah, I will not be selling out just for the sake of uh, a couple of dollars. So don't worry about that, guys. Everything will be staying true. And I know you guys aren't stupid anyway. If I was to go and start trying to push crap products down your throat i'm sure you guys wouldn't take long until you figured it out and i also don't want to be the guy that you come yelling at when the uh products are crap and overpriced or whatever it be even spray gun reviews and stuff like that um i really don't care it's all got to stay true to the uh review or it's not a review it's just an advertisement and this gun here was uh, yeah again i've since sold this the flg5 also known as the sgk 1.4 mil absolutely awesome gun the thing that really makes this gun such a winner is the price tag it's only two hundred dollars now if you're in the market or a DIY or anything like that and you're in the market for a new gun and you think oh but they've got like eighty dollar super cheap guns how much better can that two hundred dollar gun be that $200 gun in my hand, the SGK, that will last you a lifetime, especially if you clean it out every single time. The $80 super cheap gun will be not working probably after the third time you use it, and then you'll have to go out and spend the $200 on top of the $80 that you've spent on your stupid Blackridge gun and get one of these. Also, it's actually a really good spray gun. I happily use this for clear over base, more so on interior panels. It's my workhorse. So I, I mean, being an experienced painter, um, I always like to have a base coat color gun and something that you use for insides and you throw it around, you're not precious with it. Um, you just feel that you can use it for whatever and it's your, and it's just your go-to gun for an average everyday base coat clear over base job. Uh, I do like to run a dedicated clear gun a lot of the time, but for something like this, all I ended up doing, just giving the base coat a quick flush through, wipe it out with a rag, get the most of it out, flush most of that base coat out, mix your clear coat up, whack it straight in the same gun, no need to clean uh, two guns out properly. So you probably also noticed that two coats actually got me covered on this color as well. So it is the Concept Nomix base coat, as you probably noticed before, and it's at a one-to-one -one ratio recommended by them. But I actually like to leave a little bit of reducer out. I do find it covers a little bit better, and as long as you're still able to get it out of the gun, just get those coats on real nice and wet, hammer it on, and your coverage is gonna be a lot nicer especially with a red reds are quite well known for not covering in solvent range I do hear that our water-based paints are much better for coverage but that's something I haven't had the greatest deal of experience with because here in Australia it is not law to use water-based base coats so most people don't worry about it because it is a fair bit more expensive and I personally cannot see doubling the price of paint and using a little bit less of it is really going to save you money some people swear that it will but I honestly cannot see how it will especially when you've got concept paints like this which is one to one base coat ratio anyways so it goes further than most paints it's a third of the price of most paints as well but anyway we're on to the clear coat now and I'm using the HS concept clear coat which I in the past have noticed it does take quite a while to dry but I've decided, you know what, it's still a good quality clear. It gets a nice build on it. And if we have to wait for, say, a week before we actually finish polishing it, it's not going to be the biggest deal. Oh, again, just have a look at the size of that fan. It's awesome. For the price of that gun, 200 bucks. It's, yeah, I love that gun. And you just get it nice and close, and it's still got a decent sized fan on it. Uh, go nice close and quick passes. I don't know, is that a 50% overlap? It's something that when I'm painting, it just sort of happens. I don't really measure it or anything. I just paint by feel and I do recommend uh, that to a lot of people. Just grab the gun and start smashing it on. Open it up, full bore, get that pressure cranking, full fan, full fluid, and then just get it on as heavy as you can, obviously without getting big runs and solvent boil or anything like that later on. That's how I was actually taught to paint. Basically, set your gun at however it's right with the air pressure, 
open the rest of it right up and then just go for it. I have actually found since then, sometimes you are better off pulling that fluid in a little bit, especially in the colder months, but there's really not many of them in Perth, Western Australia anyway, which is where you see me painting. The method I'm doing here is something that I was taught by a few Glazerit reps while I was using their 255 HS Clear. It was more recommended while using the Develbus H1 Air Cup, which is their HVLP Air Cup for the Develbus GTI Pro. They always referred to it as a 3070 method. Now, I didn't really quite understand that at the start because 30% to me would not even be a closed coat yet. So a closed coat is so that you cannot see any of the base coat underneath your first coat of clear. Once they actually came out and told me that and showed me how to put that first coat on and then followed by the 70% coat on your second coat, and then just walk away, you'll have a cleaner job. My painting actually probably got twice as good overnight. It was amazing. Prior to that, using the HS Clear, I was getting runs and dry spray and orange peel, but all it took was those guys to come out and it was absolutely amazing. It's something that's a little bit scary the first few times you do it, but once you get the hang of it, it's great. So that's those parts done. I did a bit of a different method, something that I used to do a while ago, the 3070 method when I was uh, clearing. Um, I'll go more into detail about that later, but it's basically HS clear thin to 10%, um, two coats straight, one after another, so you put the first coat on, um, so it's just closed up, so you can't see any base coat, and then the second one, heavy coat, and then you walk away, job done. Um, but yeah, pretty happy with how it's gone. I haven't done that for quite a while. Um, it's sort of a little bit scary, it goes against you know what you what you know as in doing a full two coat system but it's um it's definitely a good good way of doing it, it saves paint and um reduces the time in the booth as well um yeah look it's they're not perfect but um it's just a quick shiny coat of paint at the end of the day for inside here there's a lot of dust and crap all through this one it's i did spend a long time blowing all those edges out but sort of hard to get it all but it's all one color and shiny I think you should be happy with it so I'll be finishing the video off with a little bit of blocking work and as I mentioned at the start of the video I'll be putting the infrared curing lights on and as you can see there it's set for 10 minutes at 100 degrees um, you don't want them to go above 100 degrees so I was always told a meter away which is just about from elbow to fingers so you don't want to go much closer than that when it's set to 100 degrees. I could actually easily talk about those infrared curing lights for well over 10 minutes so I might even actually make a dedicated video to it but a couple of things that I will say is if you're to do like a one day repair, a spot repair or a smart repair or something like that, they're absolutely awesome. You can bake out your body filler, you can then bake out every single coat of primer and you'll just about get zero shrink back because every single stage is dried right out. Then when you go to paint over it, you can infrared your paint as well and it will be far more cured than you will ever get out of a conventional spray booth bake cycle. So the block I'm using is the 3M block. It does actually have some dust extraction on it. If I wanted to, I could plug that into my vacuum cleaner. It's got holes in the sandpaper and obviously also holes in the block too. So that will get rid of the dust. Uh, it's probably a good idea to do that um, because it does maybe make your sandpaper last a little bit longer. Sometimes all I do is just get a airline or dust it off on my shorts to keep the sandpaper clean and get a bit more life out of it that way. Obviously make sure you're wearing some sort of a respirator or at least a dust mask when you're doing dry sanding because it's not good for your health. Sometimes when I tell people that I'm a spray painter they go oh no you've really got to be careful with your health and I believe that uh, if you use all the PPE correctly, it shouldn't really have that much of an effect on your health. I know I'm yet to have any bad effects from it anyway. You also may have noticed that I like to put the fine filler into the pinholes before I start blocking. I have found it will make for a much better 
end result because I have seen many times and also done it myself where you would block the entire thing down, finish it off with whatever, four or five or 600 grit, and then you go and look for your pinholes, and then you go and put fine fill in, and because you've already finished it off with 500 grit, you probably don't wanna go all the way back to 240 grit or 180 grit, which you block it with, so you're just like, well, I'll just sand that filler out with some 500 grit. Give that a quick sound back. But because the 500 grit is so fine, it will not actually cut through and it will not uh, make it dead straight. So sometimes you will see a bit of a high spot exactly where you put your filler. I also got told by a guy, this is fairly recently, probably only four or five years ago, and he was even a panel beater, but he said about directional sanding. So I also like to finish my final sanding off, see how I'm going with the shape or the direction of the panel, rather than say going up and down or round and round in circles, you go with the direction. Now I'd always done that while blocking, but I didn't see it was gonna be much of a difference to the absolute end result, and sometimes I'd rub around in circles or whatever. But um, hey, as he said, sometimes the paint can actually pull up in those circles. I mean, it could just be something that is never gonna make any difference, but it doesn't take any longer to do the directional sanding anyway, so why not do it? That's the way I look at it. I actually love this kind of stuff, setting myself a goal on a decent sized project like this. I did basically the entire job from start to finish. My business partner gave me a little bit of a hand putting the bonnet pins in because the owner wanted to change the original bonnet pins out to the other ones. But yeah, paint, panel, and polish, I did the entire job basically start to finish. The owner did come in and give me a hand doing some remove and refit, which was definitely good because I hate that kind of work. I'm not the biggest fan of doing extensive panel damage. I just like to do filler repairs. It's where I shine, I honestly believe. Filler repairs, priming, and paintwork is, yeah, probably my favorite part of this trade, and I really do enjoy it. You can keep the polishing, forget about that. I absolutely hate it. Although it can be rewarding when you see the final product finished and you know that you've done that job from start to finish. So being that I have had a bit of time off lately, I've spent loads and loads and loads of time on my website. Be sure to check it out, thegunman.net.au. If you hang around to the very end of this video, there is actually a link if you are on a computer, but if you are on a mobile device, click that little eye up in the top corner and you'll be able to find my website through that link there. I've created categories, made blogs, and made it look really good. So yeah, make sure you do check it out. Also, the rest of my social media is in the description below. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Vine. I can't even remember all of them. So just go and check out the description below. This is where we got up to on the finish of this project. I tell you what, but I really love this car, took a lot of pride in doing this job and doesn't it look a million dollars? Absolutely love the GT Cortina. I think it was a 1.6 Ford engine in it. They did come out with Lotuses in them as well. Very iconic car with those upside down peace symbols on the tail lights. I would absolutely love to own one of these in this condition and be very happy to drive one of these around as an everyday driver. I really hope you have enjoyed watching this video. If you did, show your support to my channel by giving it a big thumbs up. Now you've seen this video, get out there and paint some shit. Thanks for watching, and this has been another Gunman Production. Goodbye.